this is the introduction to Isaiah 53 and the day of the Lord. It is a uh, quick review of each of the 12 verses of Isaiah 53 without trying to have commentary as to whether it is Jesus, Israel, or the leper scholar, a man to come. There's brief commentary, but that's just to explain what the verse is about. Isaiah 53 begins with Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15. Three verses that are combined by quotes, followed by Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. Six verses that are also combined by quotes. 52.13 Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, and he rises like a tree crowned to the great height of God's righteous servant. 52.14 Just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. This is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement, as though afflicted by God, blemished, and crushed with disease. He is not a man without defect and scars, such as lambs and rams, for a sin offering <clears throat> or guilt offering in the Torah, Book of Leviticus. 52.15 Just so, he shall startle many nations. Kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. Nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silence by saying, there are four men to come, and only God's righteous servant is described. Inherently and implicitly, God's righteous servant is also the descendant of King David, as the sages believed, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. They shall be startled in silence to hear that God's righteous servant is a Gentile, according to the scripture. And that Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. Isaiah 63 says, God comes from Adam, that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity meaning he is coming from a Gentile country. And of the people, Jewish people, none are with him. His visible representation, <clears throat> God's visible representation, is a Gentile speaking and writing his words as Moses did. 53.1 and again, it begins with quotes. It's the only rendition by the Jewish Publication Society that I have found on the translated Hebrew Bible, Leningrad Codex, the oldest we have, uh, that has these quotes. All others don't have the quotes, and they don't have the quotes in chapter 52. It's a, the quotes in 52 are a demarcation from what's being talked about, fulfillment of prophecy by the return of the Assyrian Babylonian exiles. It ends with verse 12. That's it. Prophecy fulfilled, exalted, raised up. Well, they became a holy seed and they built the second temple. That's pretty good. Who can believe what we have heard? The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness that is delivered by the messenger of Elijah who receives it from the angel of the covenant? 
who is the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit that alights upon the anointed one in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Redeemed by the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy mount Zion in Jerusalem. Redeemed by speaking to his prophet again as he spoke to Moses, face to face and friend to friend, and all by and one man and with one man, the Lord calls my righteous servant. God's righteous servant who fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous. The anointed one, the shepherd God calls my servant David, Elijah who was taken to heaven and returns as a messenger of the new covenant and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism and righteousness and clears the way for the Lord. This is the reason we had the story of Elijah being taken to heaven, the only, the only person specifically taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible, and then he returns. Who does he return with? Or who, who's coming with him, although leaves before him? And God, the angel of the covenant that you desire, Again, two covenants, friendship and new covenant. The one you desire, well, you desire both. But the friendship covenant comes with David and is granted then. The angel has to have the new covenant. Elijah's been in heaven. He would know the, that's the purpose of the story. He knows the angel. The angel delivers it to him, a man, a visible representation and he delivers it. And the prophet like Moses, who wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God, and was his veritable mouthpiece on earth. Upon whom has the Lord been, the arm of the Lord been revealed? His arm of strength and power that brings victory, vindication, salvation, and redemption is revealed on God's righteous servant. Through his righteous servant, God does not perfect the world. He has his vindication upon the Gentiles, and in particular Christianity, who tormented the Jewish people, and continues so today. 53.2 For he has grown by his favor like a tree crown, like a tree trunk at a very ground. He had no former beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. This continues the uh, symbolism of the ancestral tree from chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. The anointed one, Meshach, comes and is called the twig from the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse it is a stump because God banished, and this is a prophecy, God banished the line of the kings of Judah, Jeconia in particular, in the last deportation uh, to Babylon and the destruction of the second temple. Okay, this is in Midrash form. He has grown by God's favor out of arid ground. Okay, God comes from a Gentile country with a Gentile. Interestingly enough, back to Elijah, when he is taken up to heaven, he has crossed over the Jordan River into what is now the country Jordan. But uh, it may, well, we don't know exactly where it was. 
He was an inhabitant. Elijah the Gentile, he was an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. He may have crossed over at, uh, uh, to go into Gilead, which is uh, north of Adam, uh, both of which are east of the River Jordan. But that's where he gets taken up by God, by the chariots of God, and his body disappears. He dies, as the people said, that, well, I don't know if that's what they said, I can't remember. But anyway, they couldn't find his body. He was, he's dead. He's taken up into space. Heaven, wherever that is. And uh, he comes with a Gentile. Because it says in Isaiah 63, Who's this coming from Adam? It is I. That's God. And uh, he, he flat out says that other peoples none are with me. And the peoples are the Jewish people. His peoples. To the Jewish people, God's righteous servant coming from a country of Gentiles and being a Gentile, he would have no form of beauty or charm to them. But if he comes from a Gentile country with God to Israel and converts Orthodox to Judaism and becomes an Israeli citizen, he would have form, beauty, and charm to the Jewish people. 53.3 he was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with disease. As one who hid his face from us, he was despised. We held him of no account. He will be despised and shunned for declaring that he is the anointed one and the Lord's righteous servant described in Isaiah 53. Christians will despise and shun the man who startles the nations and silences their leaders for announcing that he is the anointed one of the Jewish people that they have been waiting for and God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, that Jesus cannot be the Moshiach, which means anointed one, Messiah, same thing, of chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. For the reasons I just stated, his line comes, well I didn't mention that, the line of Jesus is the line of the banished kings of Judah. Okay? He didn't come from the stump. He comes from the ancestral tree. Chapter 11 is, the only one comes from the stump, a shoot, a new line, an ancestral tree we don't have. And that Jesus cannot be the man described in Isaiah 53. Well, notwithstanding the fact he doesn't sit the verses, it's the fact that he's a Jew. It, it just can't be him. Can't be the anointed one. And if the anointed one is described in Isaiah 53, that can't be him for another reason. The Jewish people will despise and shun him for the reason they expect and have been taught the anointed one is a Jew. Now the Gentile, in the Messianic era of exaltation, redemption, and restoration, they had been taught of by their sages and rabbis, will not be occurring. It is the nature of people to despise and shun a man who has no visible proof to substantiate his claims that God speaks to him as God spoke to Moses, that he is a man prophesied to come in the Hebrew Bible, that he is a messenger and the river of covenants of God, that the Spirit of the Holy God had alighted upon him, and that he offered himself for guilt to God. So, God's righteous servant is a man who has a life full of pain, suffering, injuries, and wounds, accustomed to illness and disease. He hid his face. Well, they held him of no account. A man who is despised and held to no account is not going to go out among the people until the perception of him changes, and he is asked to. 53.4 Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. The sickness and suffering is not being righteous. 
This is a story of a man who becomes the righteous servant, overcoming all of these things I just mentioned. Pain, suffering, wounds, injuries, familiar with disease, crushed with disease. He becomes the righteous servant. But what's the rest of the story? Well, let's go back to the beginning. We got a bunch of people who were real sick. What's the problem? They're emotionally sick from guilt and unrighteousness. You know, they haven't followed the laws of God, and the families are all, you know, tore up, and uh, they got problems at work. Everything's a problem in their lives because they aren't observant Jews. God said, live your life like this in a harsh world, which will always be a harsh world, because that's what I want for my purposes, God would say, is perfect. So that's what the quotes are about, in large part, the six verses together. God's righteous servant suffers by bearing and enduring the wounding, chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing laid on him by the words and power of God to make him suitable as a prophet of God. For God's purpose, which is totally different from making the many righteous to an extent, but it does bring people to the righteous servant, recognizing he is who he says he is, which is imperative to have the temple rebuilt. And that's the purpose that's not told us in Isaiah 53. We find it in Malachi 3, the last chapter of the prophets, the last time God speaks to his prophets. And when God prophesies and announces the day of the Lord. Okay, it's the righteous servant bearing up to and enduring this fire refinement, you know, that Ezekiel goes through. And that's how we, we know how to deci uh, describe, uh, decipher this. You know, what does all this mean? Yeah. What are they saying? Yeah, we were wounded for his sins and this and that. It all comes out in the book of Ezekiel. The only difference with Ezekiel is, you know, God says, I'm going to make your forehead like adamant. You know, harder than flint, so that you can deal with my people. They're a rebellious breed. And then we see how he does it. Ezekiel, go to your house. You will not go out amongst the people. That's Isaiah 53, I can't remember exactly which verse, where he, where he is taken from the land of the living. Who can describe his abode? Go to your house. And then he pins him to the ground. 390 days on one side facing Jerusalem, 40 days on the other side. For over a year, he's pinned to the ground. that's crushing and bruising, and he's talking to him. And some of the verses indicate that would be chastisement. Punishment, he tells him. You're being punished for the... Uh, you, you're receiving the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah, the Jewish people, for their sins. What else is the punishment would it be about? Of course it's for sins. It's the same reason they were exiled. And he was one of the exiles, by the way. And it says, he's just, eventually it says, I, I don't know exactly where, but it's punishment corresponding to their punishment. But it's still punishment he didn't deserve. He's a priestly man. A Levite, I believe. That's uh, verse 8, chapter 53, verse Okay, pick it back up.
Okay, and so then, so these witnesses, they're saying, who can believe what we have heard? You know, uh, who can believe our report? Our report is, the righteous servant is here, of Isaiah 53, the anointed one, Moshiach. We now believe, well, we now want to go back to synagogue. See, that's Elijah working too. Bring the families back together. He can tell them, be mindful. You don't have to have strict compliance with the teachings God gave Moses for all of Israel, his laws and commandments. There is a heaven. Listen to the knowledge of Elijah on heaven, a spiritual heaven. Don't just live for today. This for eternity. So he removes the sickness. That's what the story of Isaiah 53 is. Okay, then the part we accounted him as plague sent and afflicted by God. Plague means to cause continual trouble or distress to, uh, as in, he had been plagued by ill health. Smitten in biblical times meant struck as with a severe hard blow. Afflicted means grievously affected or troubled as by a disease or disfigured at birth as though cursed by God. This describes a man considered and regarded as one that God does not like. A man whose life is full of bad events, sickness, and suffering. God's righteous servant will have had persistent hardships and troubles, severely injured, and had been grievously afflicted, especially by disease and disfigurement. A person with flawed features from birth was considered cursed and afflicted by God. King David himself would have nothing to do with the lame, blind, and disfigured. For that one reason, God doesn't like you. Stay away from me. And you can't offer this man as an unblemished anything. And certainly not for uh, a system of laws for uh, sacrificial laws for atonement and worship. Fifty-three five. But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. The book of Ezekiel is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. The purpose of Ezekiel was to be a prophet and teacher of righteousness. To the exiles of Assyria, okay, that would have been the northern kingdom, Babylonia, that would be the southern kingdom, Judah, by bringing them to repentance with restitution. To prepare him, God said, he's talking to uh, Ezekiel, I will make your face as hard as theirs and your forehead as brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not fear them and do not be dismayed by them. And then God maltreats and punishes him for the punishment of the Jewish people for their sins. Okay, now I've gone over that. 53 6. We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. Now that, that, that goes to chapter, uh, verse 10. God chose to crush him with disease that if he would offer himself for guilt. That's the guilt we're talking about. It's their guilt for sinning. And it's figurative speech, people. It's figurative. Because of what the man has to go through to go help those with this guilt. Because because as he did with his he got pinned into the ground for over a year. That may not sound much. You may even think it's an exaggeration, but I sure don't. I sure don't. It's, we'll get to it. Okay, we all want to stray by uh, like sheep. Again, this goes to the story that we see unfolding in the first six verses. The Jewish people, we all want to stray. The Jewish people who are the witnesses and the speakers of verses 1 through 6 stop following the laws of God in one manner or another. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us.
53.7, he was not treated, yet he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led to slaughter, like an ooh, dumb before those who shear her, he did not open his mouth. This verse can be identified in the book of Ezekiel. God maltreats him, not man. Now, treatment is a part of God's fire refinement to be made suitable for his purpose. With God, you are always submissive. Ezekiel said the spirit seized him, and he went in bitterness in the fury of the spirit in the hand of God. The chastisement, punishment, maltreatment, crushing, and bruising in God's fire refinement is to remove this bitterness and furious nature of Ezekiel. It is to make a man meek and humble. It also makes him as hard as adamant like Flint to deal with the Jews who will not listen to him. Moses was called the most humble man on earth at the end of his life. And God had him for 40 years. And uh, this is all about being silent or, or people aren't hearing from you. It goes along with being shunned, despised. You hid your face. <clears throat> uh, you know, he did not open his mouth. Like Ezekiel, God will take the righteous servant from society and confine him to his house for God's fire refinement, not allowed to go out among the people, silent as a lamb to all that know him. 53.8. By oppressive judgment he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living, through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. By, <clears throat> okay, the oppressive judgment is being guilty and receiving a sentence of imprisonment and of wounding maltreatment chastisement, punishment, bruising and crushing until suitable for God's purpose. This is just another way to look at this offering for guilt. A purpose that includes making the many righteous. This is the task of the righteous servant. That doesn't have anything to do with God's purpose that might prosper. And um, you can say, you know, if, if you look at it as a guilty plea, you can say God is using the verses symbolically with the offering for guilt being shown as a guilty plea before a judge of crimes not committed by the defendant. It's more like an analogy. Who can describe his abode? This would be the jailer. The spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness in the fury of my spirit. While the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. That's Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 14. This would be the prison. And the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And he spoke to me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. That's Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 14. Well, what spirit do you think that is? Let's think. Huh. How about the Holy Spirit? Since God sent him to the house to take him from the land of the living, remove him from society so he can... It's the entryway to the fire refinement. The change. Chains. As for you, O oh, mortal, cords have been placed upon you. And you have been bound with them. And you shall no go, not go out among them. That's Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 25. All of Israel will be able to describe the abode of God's righteous serving in the day of the Lord because of social media and phones with cameras, an abode to be honored in Isaiah chapter 11. Okay, back to, for he was cut off from the land of the living. Being cut off from something means you cannot have it or get to it. Cut off from the land of living by a man given long life means cut off from society and the material things of the world, not death. It's the only place in Isaiah 53 you could say that there is something about death. 
That's not what it's about. Ezekiel was cut off from the land of the living, bound by God's power in his house. And then it says, through the sin of my people. Now, we've talked about this, <clears throat> about the punishment. The people of Isaiah, who are the Jewish people, that's my people. So, uh, and this actually began in verse 7. Verses 7 to 10 are Isaiah as the speaker. My people, that's how you know. And it starts, uh, uh, verses 1 through 6 are the witnesses. Jewish people who are sick because of their unrighteousness and not being observant Jews. Um, in case I didn't cover it, who deserves the punishment? Ezekiel suffers the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah for 430 days. The houses of Judah and Israel suffered their punishment in exile. There was no vicarious suffering by Ezekiel for the sins of the Jewish people. His punishment corresponded to the punishment of the Jewish people. 53.9 And his grave was set among the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no injustice and had spoken no falsehood. This verse says, the righteous servant of God was poor, but dies a rich man. The righteous servant of God becomes poor when God cuts him off from the world, and then he is given the many as his portion, and receives the multitude as his spoil, and his abode will be honored. He dies a rich man. 53.10 But the Lord chose to crush him by disease, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. And if through him, the Lord's purpose might prosper. Through him, clear the way. My purpose is to return to my temple suddenly. Go get my temple built, I'll give you a hand. And we say that because we know God's already here. The covenant of friendship's here. David's here. And he's been here a long time. He's been here since 1957, as a matter of fact. The state of Israel was created in 1948, and it was still a desolation. And uh, you know this, this, this time to come with Jeremiah is not the return of the exiles. Because they couldn't have restored Israel, as it is today, much less at the Promised Land. Because the northern kingdom was inhabited by Gentiles, imported by Assyria when they deported the Israelites of the northern kingdom defeated them. And the Lord chose to crush him by disease. God's righteous servant will be a man of suffering familiar with disease, and then his life is crushed because of the disease that he is afflicted with by the power of God. Okay, so if David's here, God's here, then God that's when God grants the covenant of friendship that includes uh, in so many verses, making the land bloom again. Okay, it took them a while to get going. Yeah. Hey. Oh, thanks, Dad. Yeah, that's, uh, it's been open, but just barely. It's just a spoonful out of it. Now, uh, I don't, I probably won't get to the store till I get back this afternoon. Oh, don't worry about it. I still got a little, uh, yeah, that's you good. You got enough for, yeah. and for lunch and stuff I won't be back till after lunch sometime. I mean I you know, it'll just depend on Nancy. Well listen, I just need a soda if you wanna uh, stop at the stop and go or something. You don't have to go to the store. Well we'll we'll see when I get home. Anyway I got a update from the nurse this morning and they're gonna check her for the pneumonia, but it sounds like she's doing pretty good. I got a feeling she's gonna be coming home pretty quick. Good, good. So uh, the doctor's supposed to come in this morning and and go, you know, give her a good check. So we'll, well see. Well, you know, when she comes back, you just come get me. I'll get her out of the car and get her up here. Yeah, well, it, I will. It, but it will, I I don't know that they're gonna let her go today. But yeah. I I don't think it'll be very long. Okay. So. Uh, 
Anyway, that's kind of uh, maybe I can find out more from the doctor, you know, if I can see him. Well, keep me posted. I will. I sure will. Pick him back up. Then we have that if he made himself an offering for guilt. It's an offer. An offering of oneself and soul to God for the guilt of sinning of the Jewish people in return for possibly seeing his children because it said he might see his children and have long life. Might. You know, God's purpose might prosper. His purpose is return to the simple suddenly. The task of the righteous servant is never uh, cast in the light of he might do it, as though he certainly will. But even so, it's still he might get long life. And remember, he's been crushed with, with uh, disease, a disease that exposes him to death. The offering is only a test. Verse 10 is a test. It's got other purposes, but as to the righteous servant and God, this covenant between them, God says, you offer yourself for guilt, I might give you all life. And that's where devotion and reverence comes in, which we'll see in just a moment. And one of the attributes found of the spirit that alights upon him which is written for antiquity, because we don't really think of spirit in that manner anymore. At least I don't. Okay, when the test of devotion, which is, will he offer himself for guilt and go to God's fire of refinement? Or not? It's set before the righteous servant, the new covenant has already arrived. That is why the angel of the covenant of Malachi 3, that you desire arise before Elijah the messenger, the clearer of the way, and God. The new covenant of Jeremiah 31, where the inequities and sins of the Jewish people are given, and God remembers them no more. The guilt and emotion is from not following the laws and teachings of God by the Jewish people. God's forgiveness of the sins of the Jewish people removes their guilt, not the offering of the righteous servants for it. He doesn't really offer anything. I mean, he makes the offer, but it's just a test. Will he do it? He doesn't actually take the, the guilt or, uh, of the Jewish people. It's, it's not supposed to be there. It's speaking your language again. It's not supposed to be there because the sins are forgiven. Now, they still may feel emotion, this and that, but that's no different. Okay, but there's enough on that. Anyway, that's why it's just a test. It's because the angel leaves before them. That, every time I read that, I was just like, what is that? Because he wouldn't tell me. I didn't find out until we typed it up. I was like, why does that angel leave before? How come it's not here? How long does it take to get here? You know, that's kind of idea. But anyway, the devotion is trusting that God will not let him die. So, why does God choose to trust him, uh, choose to crush him with disease for this test? Well, see, that's the other purpose as I mentioned. Because he knows what the Gentiles are going to do. You cannot offer an animal blemished or with defect. So God blemishes and disfigures the man. No man would refuse God. And God does not need a man's permission to make him a servant. He is God. In the book of Ezekiel, God had his spirit seize him and put him to the fire of refinement. God knew what the Christians would do with the words wounded, punished, not treated, bruised, crushed, and chastised, and they did. They took the book he gave his children, the Jewish people, and called it their own, saying that Jesus, the unblemished Lamb of God, 
is described by Isaiah 53. In fact, it's written to make sure he does not. And God knew you would ignore it, Christians, just using those words. That's why he does it. Wound you for our sins. This and that. Because he, he said, wait a minute. You saying he helped create Christianity? Not at all. Well, he may have in a sense. But uh, he said they're going to take it either way. They're just going to say, your God of Israel lets you and he's with us. They're going to do it either way. But this way. Especially here in the day of the Lord, after he passes his right to them. Let's see, 53 acts as a snare, a trap for the day of the Lord. As one of the purposes for why it is written in the manner that it is. You know, because why not just say, if he will put himself through the fire of refinement of my breaking him like some wild horse. You know, he could have just said it. But it's also a proof of who I am. Because I'm the only one that's ever understood this and linked it as backup to the book of Ezekiel. So anyway, the man's blemish or defect, receives long life, sees his children, makes him any righteous by his knowledge. It's not Jesus. It's not by his blood. In the day of the Lord and the appearance of the true righteous servant of God, the blemished and disfigured prophet of God. The cornerstones of the churches and the Vatican will be removed. And the end of Christianity will begin. He said that's not even remotely possible. You go ask the Jews what happened to their temple. Ask them what exile is like when God's wrath and punishment is on you. And as we've been saying, he didn't actually lift up those arms. They were just there. But what he's got for you, Christians, is me. The true righteous servant. And somebody who knows how to read it. I bet I don't get too many takers on debating me. I just lost my back screen. A couple of videos ago, I showed the different exhausts in the motorcycle I plan on getting. Indian Scout 60, blacking. Uh, these are the ones that uh, we selected. Myself, the Spirit, and God. And of course, God actually selected it. We just agreed. It's called the High Power Grenades. I'm going to put it on as soon as I finish 11 and 12. And then, following the motorcycle, it's about two and a half minutes. Uh, God has, has, has dictated uh, a new writing to me. Uh, it was actually some time ago. It's, you know, it's the word of the Lord came to me and said, and the word of the Lord, of course, is the Holy Spirit, and said, write this down. And it starts in quotes, and it's God speaking himself. And he can speak through me. But you might want to stay tuned for that. 5311, out of his anguish he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion, by his knowledge. My righteous servant makes the many righteous. It is their punishment that he bears. Okay. The anguish is from the fire of refinement that ends when the man is suitable for God's purpose that might prosper. Jesus didn't come out of his anguish. 53, 12. Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil. For he exposed himself to death. Exposed. He did not die. This righteous servant who gets long life. And was numbered among the sinners. Well, he's a Gentile. He's not observant. Doesn't recognize God. Well, anyway, he's a Gentile. How's that? Whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made the intercession for sin. A 
Okay, now I've got one other thing I'm going to add to this. I need to, the reason I'm going to do this primarily is because I need a little time. Melchizedek of Salem was a priest of the Lord, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. Salem is Jerusalem on God's <laughs> holy Mount Zion. God Most High formed Israel by first naming, naming Abram to be a Hebrew. Canaanites were the inhabitants of Jerusalem when the land was allotted to the tribe of Benjamin. Though the tribe never fully defeated them or completely removed them from Jerusalem. King Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High and he blessed Abram of God Most High. And he blessed God Most High for delivering the foes of Abram into his hands. And Abram tithed the, the priests of God Most High, a tenth of everything. God Most High had an unknown person who refers to David as my Lord, small case Lord. Write Psalm chapter 110 concerning, it, it starts out, it's uh, Psalm 110, 
of, which means concerning David. So it's not David writing. And God declared David a priest forever, a rightful king. So like Melchizedek, he became a priest, and of course he was uh, became king when Saul after Saul died. A rightful king. So verse one, I'm going to give you the first four verses of David a song. The Lord said to my Lord, okay, that's capital L Lord. So that's the God of Israel. Said to my Lord, small case L. Again, this indicates a servant of King David. And he refers to him as my Lord. It's kind of typical. And says, uh, the Lord said to my Lord. So God said to David, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. Now Christians say God's talking to God. God's talking to Jesus. Or they somehow, somehow, one way or another, they fit Jesus into this. It's, they, they don't understand, I guess, that it's a servant of King David uh, who is uh, the Lord King. Verse 2, the Lord will stretch forth from Zion, your mighty scepter, hold sway over your enemies. This is not prophecy. Your people come forward willingly on your day of battle in majestic holiness from the womb, from the dawn. Yours was the dew of youth. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You or a priest forever, a rightful king, and a small case K, by my decree. That's Psalms chapter 110, verses 1 through 4. See, this prose is poetry. And it's, that's not prophecy. Well, the Christian thing is, that, well, yeah, we agree with that. Well, you know, it just depends. You know, the Messianic era is just a bunch of cherry picking. Where's the vengeance? Where's the utter destruction? Where's the armies being raised? Where, where's the reckoning and dismissal of the rabbis? I mean, you know, you're just picking what you want to. You, you accuse the Christians of doing that. You anti-missionaries do. Outreach Judaism, Jews from Judaism. Well, you do the same thing. And then you force in an interpretation of the people Israel being Isaiah 53 that's worse than theirs. And that's hardly even possible. Except the arguments that you set forth are absurdities. Okay, so this unknown person, guess what he was? He's a man in divine things. He's got a task. God went to him, because this is God's words he's writing. God went to a man, a servant of David, King David, and said, I want you to do something for me. I have a task for you. And to talk to him, God's spirit a lit and entered into him, and God was in his spirit, and he could hear God's words. We learned that in Ezekiel. So there's a, there's a man in divine beings. Well, how about the guy that wrestled with Jacob? He is a man in divine beings. Jacob even tells you. God just went to some fellow sleeping near Jacob and said, uh, I'm the God of this land. I have something for you to do. And, of course, the man said, okay, <laughs> I'm ready. Go wrestle, go jump on that guy, start wrestling. Yeah, don't worry, baby. I'm going to orchestrate the whole thing. Because I got something to say to him. And all of God's prophets went through a fire refinement in some degree. You know, it depends on the task, their nature, if they need to be changed, if they need to have the fire knocked out of them so that they'll be listening and observant and do exactly what he says at all times and without argument, and not to be emotionally dismayed. You know, if he's going to apply your power to somebody who gets emotionally dismayed, uh, he's, he's going to put you through the hoops, get you as close to it as he can with uh, the fire refinement, and then he'll use his power to go the rest of the way to make you um, most suitable for his purpose. A person who doesn't get this made. The angel of the presence of God, who is the person of the Spirit of the Holy God, who is the Holy Spirit, 
and the angelic messenger of his words as the word of the Lord. That's a name. That's his name. Word of the Lord. Angelic messenger. Came to me, Keith, and said, you are to write these words of the God of Israel. Quote, I have come to the earth to dwell with my anointed one, Keith Ellis McCarty, as I once came to dwell among the tents of the Israelites, and who writes and speaks my words exactly as I speak them, as my servant David did. Keith Ellis McCarty is the twig that sprouts from the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, the lineal descendant of King David to King Solomon, prophesied by my servant Isaiah, a son of David, upon whom my spirit, that is the angel of my presence, alighted upon and entered in the first year of his life in 1957. And I was in my spirit, revealing myself to him in 2007. Keith Ellis McCarty is Elijah, prophesied by my servant Malachi, to return in the day of the Lord, to clear the way before me, to deliver the new covenant with my forgiveness of the sins of the Jewish people, I declared in the book of Jeremiah, and to recounsel the members of the families of the Jewish people, each to the other being mindful of the teachings and laws I gave Moses at order, bringing the Jewish families to or back to the observance of Judaism and righteousness, and to be in right standing with me. Keith Ellis McCarty is the prophet like Moses, prophesied by me and written by my servant Moses, whom I speak with face to face and as one friend to another, that I converse with whenever I so wish, who converses with me whenever he so wishes and who writes my words exactly as I tell him to. Keith Ellis McCarty is my righteous servant, prophesied by my servant Isaiah, that makes the many righteous, a man of suffering, familiar with disease, that I chose to crush with the disease, and made his soul and himself an offering for the guilt of the Jewish people in a test of devotion. The man who I have wounded, chastised, bruised, crushed, maltreated, and punished in the world, and by my hand, all of his life. The man that has been exposed to death four times by my power, and survived by my power. The man that I have given long life to in order that he accomplishes his many tasks. And the man who is my visible representation in the day of the Lord speaking and writing my words. Keith Ellis McCarty is the only Gentile I have ever forgiven of sins and iniquities other than the captain of the Lord's hosts and Elijah, and who I have written into the scroll of remembrance I am preparing in this day, the day of the Lord, for the heaven I am creating for the Jewish people, for passing my test of devotion, for agreeing to go through my fire refinement to prepare him as a prophet. And for all the suffering he has endured in life for the Jewish people and myself. Keith Ellis McCarty is the host of the Lord's host, which means my Holy Spirit alighted upon him, entered him, and my presence is in my Holy Spirit. I control his every perception, decision, judgment, thought, physical action, mannerisms, and words in my power throughout the day and night. My presence and the presence of my Holy Spirit are always with him, wherever he may be. And Keith Ellis McCarty is a priest forever, a rightful king by my decree, after the manner of Melchizedek and my son, David. My hand shall be constantly with him, and my arm shall strengthen him. No enemy shall oppress him, and no vile man will afflict him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. I am God. I created all things. I divided light 
and I divided water. I created and formed Keith Ellis McCarty for my purposes, just as I created and formed Israel for my purposes. That's how scripture is written. Where the Lord comes to you, or God comes, you know, sometimes saying God says, but they're always together. Whoever they're talking to is a man of the divine being, which is a host of the Lord's host. And that's only pointed out in one place, it's in Joshua. Can't remember chapter and page, but it has to do with three verses in the captain of the Lord's host, who is a Gentile and a harbinger, because he's never mentioned again, of the righteous servant, who is a Gentile host of the Lord's host, man of divine beings. And this is how scripture is written. Okay. Um, skipping by this. Okay. You know, I am Elijah. That's my purpose as the righteous servant of Isaiah 53, my task. Make the many righteous. For Elijah is written, uh, bring the family back together, being mindful of God's laws. It's the same thing. And it's a purpose that might prosper of God. It's the same thing for Elijah who clears the way. He fails, utter destruction comes. I'm the prophet like Moses. I've written two books. And I've put on almost uh, 39, 38 to 40 videos, all of which are at the command and direction of God, just as the books are. Now, I guess you can't consider video scripture, but there's probably some of come up with some kind of name for it because they are divinely given. They're divinely, he's talking to me as I speak to you throughout these videos, and so is the Spirit of God. This is theirs. It's not mine. The books aren't mine. They're just in my name. I'm just the man. They're the divine beings. And this is how God communicates with the world. And you say, well, we never see that or know that. That's right. And it's written that way. You weren't supposed to. And all other kinds of factors. Because it's my proof. It's my proof. If all the Jews for 3,000 years, as much as y'all had poured, they had poured over this book. I mean, God tells me, well, we're not doing anything in the Torah. They just hammered the Torah. Now, that's not his wording, it's mine. For <laughs> the Holy Spirit. But, uh, you know, did I just suddenly become the smartest religious Jew of all time? This atheist of 50 years? This Gentile from Texas? Did, 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 have I just outdone them all? Do you think that's remotely possible? If I am the smartest religious Jew that's ever lived, will you listen to me even if I'm not God's prophet and righteous servant? Yeah, I don't think so. No, Isaiah vouched for me. Okay, Moses vouched for Joshua, and therefore they did not have to test him. You know who vouches for me? Isaiah. He vouches for me by description. This man is the righteous servant of God. Here's his description. And he's not describing the Jewish people, much less the unblemished Lamb of God and the descendant of David, which to me has to do with uh, taking the temple not, but he's a warrior. He's a battler. Indeed, he was a murderer. <laughs> he, was an exile. he went out killing, killing uh, the enemies of God and, you know, lying about it to the people he had gone to. I guess it was Philistines. It was Philistines. And, uh, but I say murder because he killed their women too. Because they might tell on him. So they might tell on him, maybe we'll go ahead and kill him. So he's a little bit more savage than most people let on. You don't see that part of him in the movie. Uh, but all these great names mean nothing. Eternal priest, priest forever, rightful king. Now, all that's important is this. I'm a man in divine banks. Spirit of God lit upon me, a descendant of David, a twig. I don't really have his attributes. But I can get done what needs to be done in this day. And a man in divine banks, that makes me a host of the Lord's host. He's the one who explained all that to me. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see why the angel 
the left before God and the messenger. You know, he, I don't even know these things because God tells me. And that would be true for anybody. So, you know, my name's Keith. I like the idea that I'm a prophet. You know, again, I've never been religious. The names are, I mean, they fascinate me and everything. And uh, I love reading about them, Elijah, David, Moses. But uh, I'm a prophet of God. They say a man of God sometimes. But uh, for somebody like me, that's pretty impressive. And he did orchestrate a miserable, painful life for me. And he hadn't quit. He hadn't quit by any stretch of imagination. It's gotten worse every year. And uh, you see here the things I had to say about it. I caught then my But uh, he, he just put me through some stuff the last three months, well, even while I'm doing this. And of course, the whole time I'm going, wait a minute, how come I'm not suitable? Why am I still in the fire refining? What is wrong with you? And I get the same answer. Uh, I'm God. There's nothing wrong with me. If there's anything wrong with anyone around here, it's you. <laughs> so anyway, he's still not done with it. He ain't got me where he wants me. And I am tired of it. And they tell me when I get to neglect. I've got to get to Ding Gurion Airport. I got to make it to Israel. And he said, "That's where the fire goes out." Meantime, he said, "There's always more I can do. A little more suffering. He <laughs> just make it better." You should hear some of my replies when I'm not laughing on my video. <laughs> so anyway. It's to prevent me from being dismayed as much as it's really not my furious uh, spirit as much as it is. He's still coating my emotions so that when people don't listen to me, they spit at me. They, uh, the Christians call me the Antichrist. Of course, my answer is going to be, you're right. I'm nothing like him. That's why he's not the man by the day of 53. But they got, you know, their whole thing with the devil and Satan and the revelation. Yeah, there's no reason to read the revelation. Once you see the first lie, it's time to go, okay. And the rest of it is just, you know, it's written by a madman who's just hodgepodging to out the Jewish Bible and just pulling stuff up and making things up as it goes. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7, Jesus speaking through an angel. Now, you got to ask yourself, how did they come up with that and the Jews didn't? Somehow, they was because they believed the Holy Spirit was a person. So they were able to put it together. The angel of the Lord's in a bush. God speaks. They're together. Maybe not like I've explained it. But it's anyway, Revelation, speaking to an angel, he tells the writer John, who most people do not think is a disciple of John, but it could be. I think he claims to be. Or says something like that. Uh, those who pierce me with the spear shall see me return. <laughs> that would be the Romans who speared him on the cross to make sure he's dead. Okay, right off there, you start out with the false prophecy in verse 7 of the first chapter. You know what you do? You put that book down. You put that book down. And when you're God, when your God prophesizes, that's the fifth time. Four times before that when he's coming back and that doesn't happen, you stop waiting on him. And he says, I'm coming quickly three different times. Coming quickly in one chapter. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. Really? Is it a problem we don't know about? Is there a reason you're coming back? Uh, I think I think part of his thinking was uh, because it says he partook of the flesh and the blood with the children so that he could defeat the devil at death. I think he thought he was going to defeat the devil. Remember, this is antiquity. He's going to defeat the devil by drinking the blood of a human being and um, getting extra power and um, common belief back then. Drink another man's blood. The Mayans would sacrifice human beings to their gods, their deities, uh, because of their belief that blood was so powerful. Because it gave life. They knew if you took the blood out, the body died. And uh, the, the Mayans, you know, they're, they're, they're gone. 
Then there is a culture that didn't make it. Uh, Jews, Jews for Judaism. I mean, not, you know, it's just like more has been put on us than anything. Well, there's no man left. Well, they have to them. It sounds like they got put on pretty good, too. But actually, we know better than all that. And you go from the man who at least had human sacrifice correct. The human makes the human sacrifice to God, hoping they'll be granted favor. Now, why on earth does God make a human sacrifice to Gentile? Why? What is his purpose? What is he gaining? What is he gaining? These sinful Gentiles that he's got to sacrifice his sons for so that their sin free and can disobey him? His laws and commandments? It's the most ridiculous concept. I, can, I don't think you can come up with something more absurd and ridiculous than that when it comes to God. It's amazing. It's God, you, you're going to heaven, huh? Why is that? Huh? Oh, God killed his son for me so I could go to heaven in case of sin and stuff. Huh? In case you did? Huh? Remember, I grew up with you. Huh? Yeah. Are you an observant Jew? Well, why, why, why are you going to, to heaven? God's making a new, he tells us what he's doing. I'm making a new heaven with the name Israel, sure, I'm good. He didn't say anything about a Gentile. Doesn't say anything about Jesus either. Can't wait to get old, man. I don't think they watch my videos very far. I got some, I got one person didn't last a second. I got serious Christian. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think that wraps it up. I, I have some more things here, but. Uh, there's a lot of other information in the books. I mean, the videos hit everything important. And as you can see, you know, it took me seven videos just for Isaiah 53. And uh, I've, I've combined things. You can now find just about everything I've done in five videos. I've, I've joined them in groups. You know, general chapters, uh, Isaiah 53, and... Um, for each book, for each book dictates in the Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, the first book, and then the second book, the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, which is my life, so that you can see how I fit the verses. Okay, well, that's all I have. Thank you very much.